This is Star Talk, Cosmic Queries Edition, and we've titled this one Fermentation and Flavor Science. Ooh. Welcome, Chuck. Hey, Chuck, man. You, man. How are you, buddy? Always good to have you. You're, you. I don't know if people know you're my co-host in Star Talk Sports Edition. That's right. You're quite the sports weenie, I have come to learn. I- <laughs> <laughs> That's a compliment. I was going to say. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. You know, when you the word sports and weenie don't really oh, yeah, go so together. True, that's true. You can be weather weenie. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry. Okay. You're, you're sports but I fan. Like, no, I like sports weenie. I'm going to be that. <laughs> no, we need a we need an alliterative thing because weather weenie alliterates. So right. sports, I'll find something else for it. Okay, cool. But uh, this is about this is about food and and what role fermentation plays. I am a world. big fan of fermentation. Uh, of fer- Fermented food, and can, I, well, neither food. of us, <laughs> neither of us, have Rec- exp- recreational fermentation. <laughs> neither of us has expertise in this, but we got someone from the Star Talk Rolodex. Yeah, Dr. Ariel Johnson. Ariel, welcome back to Star Talk. Thanks so much for having me back. I think you were last on the show in a live. Uh, Star Talk Live. It, it, I think it was in New York City Town Hall. I, I believe it was. Uh, yeah, well, excellent. Well, <laughs> thanks for thanks for coming back. And, thanks so much for having me back. And we, we did a whole show on food. Let me remind people who you are if you didn't either attend or uh, see that episode. You have a PhD in agricultural and environmental chemistry, which is this is true. Very cool. I'm glad it's true. <laughs> Thank you for verifying. Uh, our crack team of researchers. Yeah. Came up with that <laughs> Good about. job. <laughs> Our investigative reporters <laughs> found this about you. You're a science officer for Good Eats on the Food Network, and you're a food writer with stuff yes. published in the Lucky Peach, I think, LA Times, and there's one here called Mold Magazine. That's Mold a thing. Magazine. It's a it's a uh, speculational magazine about the future of food. So if you're into uh, well, food or design, it's a pretty quite, excellent read. Quite frankly, I don't think you're speculating when you call it mold. <laughs> That's just something. It's like I am not picking up that magazine. It is, it, 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 well, all, all food will eventually in the future. Exactly. There, mold. <laughs> there's no there's no speculation there. <laughs> all but, food plus you will mold. <laughs> I <laughs> as, as suppose there might be an element of the uh, the, the hominins of uh, mold mold being fungus and mold mm. being molding like a verb. Uh, yeah, there you uh, go. Right, mold, molding. The right. Well, let me let me lead off with a question here. So, I think in modern times where we have modern means of preservation, I think we might have lost track or lost understanding of how fermented foods ever made their way into our diet in the first place, Hmm. right? Hmm. And so, you know, why do we have cheese? Well, if I I know my history correctly, this was a a product of like fermented proteins in a milk or whatever, Mm -hmm. milk products that that would last longer than the milk itself in in the closet. So how how much, (laughs) is it basically all of fermentation was just to preserve food? Is, Is this a fair characterization of it all? Yeah, I mean, um, most fermentation processes do preserve food, um, often by adding acids to them or uh, killing off less desirable bacteria and microorganisms. Um, one thing I because I, I, I only want the de- the desirable bacteria, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The uh, the undesirable bacteria is is not so good right. for you. Um, you know your uh, your. Uh, norovirus which is a virus um obviously or your uh you know various spoilage spoilage molds and yeasts Mm -hmm. um not so tasty but i mean one one thing i like a way that i like to think about fermentation is that like you know back in uh probably not that far back in history but pre uh pre-refrigeration and you know even even pre-agriculture um most food would ferment pretty quickly uh, so if you if you milk milk your cow or your goat or whatever sort of uh, ruminant animal you have hanging around your your village or your campsite, um, that milk is going to start fermenting pretty quickly. Um, so vegetables, likewise, if you uh, if you pick them and store them for a while, will start fermenting. Same with same with grapes or fruit, things like that. Um, so so when I think of fermentation, I think of the sugar. It, mm-hmm. Like I, I can't think of fermented string beans, but I can think of a fermented grape or, or fruit. So how, how do well, you ferment things that don't have sugar in them? Well, string beans actually have sugar in them. So most most vegetables have like 
anywhere between like two and even up to like 15% sugar for like- My mama never told me that string beans had sugar. (laughs) Just a little bit. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So uh, Maybe that's why my mom kept trying to give them to me as dessert. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It has sugar in it. (laughs) Um, No, well, so like one of the most, one of the most like pervasive fermentations across like Eurasia is fermented cabbage. Um, So you see it as like sauerkraut in Germany, kimchi in Korea. Um, Swang Kai or Pao Kai uh, across across China's uh, various variations on Kislaya Kapusta uh, across uh, more Slavic speaking regions. So, I mean, that's a vegetable. It's a vegetable that accumulates sugar and, uh, you know, you can harvest it pretty late and then ferment it to make it last the winter. Right. And, wow. and what's, what's the deal with the process? Is it just because it's pre-refrigeration and it's such an old um, tradition that they bury the the uh, whatever it is that they fermenting. I've heard about that. What's up with what, that? What is that with that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I th- this is putting on my sort of amateur anthropologist hat more, but um, you know, one one can imagine situations where if you're uh, you know, hum- humans pre-agriculture and pre-history, even like pre- pre-permanent uh, settlements, um, where you, uh, you know, forage or harvest uh, vegetables or uh, hunt for animals and then to uh, to keep them safe and keep them away from scavengers once you've already already got them. It, the, one of the best ways is to like dig a hole and, you know, line the hole with leaves or something like that and then bury it and come back to it later. Okay. So that wasn't fundamental to the fermenting. So the process, it doesn't really do anything for the process. Well, so burying, burying underground does protect things from oxygen. So it excludes oxygen, um, which then knocks out a whole category of uh, spoilage microbes like molds. Um, So So, I mean, if we're talking about like fermented fruits or vegetables, um, that, that'll often be lactic acid bacteria. Um, and most lactic acid bacteria doesn't, doesn't need oxygen. Some of them um, don't like oxygen at all. So if you- So this, uh, is, a, this is a way to tune the microbial yeah. cocktail for yeah. what it is that comes out the other end. It's, it's sort of like cooperative microbe farming. Um, wow. Like n- nudging it in a, in a certain direction. Cool. Mm-hmm. Very cool. And, and so, but wait a minute, isn't, um, what's the difference then between fermented cabbage and mm-hmm. pickled cabbage? When I think of mm-hmm. coleslaw, I think that it's pickled, not fermented. Is that, right. am I wrong? Yeah. Well, so coleslaw, I mean, so so you get into here like a language thing. So like pickling can, can mean fermenting. So like cucumber pickles are usually fermented, um, but you can also pickle things by adding, just adding acids. To them without fermenting, so um, often, often using vinegar to pickle. Uh, I mean, vinegar is the product of another fermentation, so you're you know kind of <laughs> either either doing fermentation or having done fermentation and now using it for something else. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, pick, pickling, especially in uh, in America, um, there's a strong tradition of like vinegar pickling. Uh, not, not right, right. So so just, I can grow a grape. Drink the grape mm-hmm. juice. The grape juice I don't mm-hmm. drink. I can ferment it, and mm-hmm. I can make wine. And then I can ferment yes. the wine and make vinegar. And I can yes. use the vinegar to ferment a cucumber and make a pickle. It is. It is truly the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. So all I need is some is some grapes. <laughs> Yeah, grapes some grapes and, and some sugar and uh, whatever right. wild yeasts and bacteria are hanging out on their skins. Wow, that's it. Wow. wow. Yeah. Well, why don't we why don't we go to some Q and A here? I oh, mean, cool. I, I, I was going to eat up the whole the whole show, but th- this is a cosmic queries after all. And mm-hmm. Chuck, yeah. you got the questions. I've never I haven't seen any of these questions. I don't think you have either. Is that right? N- uh, n- uh, Ariel has not. I, right, I, okay. I definitely mm-hmm. not. No, uh, so I we're have. here to stump you. That's oh, what we're okay. trying to do. <laughs> okay. okay, I'll try my best. <laughs> okay, no, I go for cool. it, Chuck. All right, so these are all Patreon patrons and. Um, Basically, let's go with um, K Profit 32, who says, Hey, Dr. Johnson, why doesn't fermented food make you sick? It is essentially spoiled food. Also, Ooh. what is your take on kombucha? It makes me feel like garbage. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. <laughs> thank you for your answer. Love no, you, Neil. You. Have a nice day. <laughs> Have a nice day. <laughs> 
Oh man. Well, so so if, if we're talking about spoilage, um, you know, some of that has actual like actually to do with safety, um, but then some of it also has to do with just definitions that that we apply somewhat somewhat subjectively. So I mean, if you uh, if you smelled the smell of a like beautifully fermented camembert cheese, um, if you did not know it was supposed to smell that way you would run away from it because, uh, you know, it's a, a, we, had a, we had a magnet up at a shop I used to work at that said, what's that smell? It's either bad meat or good cheese. Um, so, <laughs> so context is very important for this. Um, but also- uh, and, and some cheeses smell like gym socks too. Yes, you know? yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a right. whole, a whole uh, landscape. It's either gym socks you pick up with forceps and take mm-hmm. to the, the right. washing machine or it's cheese and you spread it on cracker and eat right. it. Right, exactly. It. Yeah. 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 Um, and the stinkier, the more expensive somehow. Uh, yeah, right. yeah, because it has to be very carefully uh, tended to achieve that uh, that quality. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so some of it is just you know aesthetic, um, but uh, a lot of uh, a lot of fermentation is just stuff that we've learned over thousands or millions of years um, to like intentionally you know keep in the right conditions and uh, coax what bacteria or fungi are growing on it um, so that, you know, from experience, it is actually safe for us. Uh, but so, so what you're saying is it's been trial and error historically mm-hmm. to eat some spoiled foods and it kills you and other spoiled foods don't kill you and they you develop a taste for it. Yeah. So we have... So, <laughs> so there's a lot of dead humans, dead, dead humans. <laughs> who, who, ga- who gave their life so that we could yeah. eat some stinky cheese. Precisely, precisely. Oh my god! I mean, th- think of it. Think of it as a uh, like you know millions to billions of person hours of R and D uh, just so we can get these. Uh, that's that's what it is. Things. Yeah. And so because if I put, I remember you do this experiment in elementary school. You take. Uh, some slices of bread, right. throw some water in the bread bag and put it under the sink, right? Right. And mm-hmm. come back in a week and it's mold growing on it. Yeah. And and I pay top dollar for Roquefort moldy mm-hmm. cheese and I'm going to eat the cheese, but I'm not going to eat the mold on the bread. But yeah. could I eat the mold on the bread? I mean, would I say, um, hmm, this is tasty? I would... That sounds like a no. I'm taking that as a no. (laughs) I I don't, I can't, I'm not sure that would be actually dangerous, but um, I would not recommend it. Although uh, there are some, some Rope 4 producers do like intentionally bake breads that become uh, infected or uh, cultured with penicillium molds and then use that to sort of kickstart the, uh, the cheese fermentation. Well, if you're, if you grow up in a household like mine and you have a great grandmother who was born at the turn of the last century. Mm -hmm. Moldy bread just means this part gets cut out (laughs) and now now you got some good bread to eat. Good good bread. (laughs) So tell me about kombucha. Kombucha, yeah. Well, so kombucha is- First of um, all, wait, can you mm -hmm. please, what is it? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, So so kombucha is, uh, I'm basically fermented tea. Um, more technically, it's, uh, you start with a sweetened tea, so tea and sugar and water, um, and then you use a special culture of microbes called a SCOBY, a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeasts. So it's uh, alcohol-producing yeasts and acetic acid-producing bacteria that all live together. Um, and basically what happens is that the yeasts in the, in the SCOBY um, ferment the sugars in the sweetened tea into alcohol, and then the acetic bacteria munch on that alcohol and create acetic acid, uh, which you might also know as vinegar. Um, And the bacteria also make, uh, they call them exopolysaccharides. It's basically like goop. Um, So everything floats together in this sort of like mushroom looking uh, cellulose based raft. Wait, wait. So, what chemical is responsible for the hair that grows on your chest after you drink this stuff? <laughs> yeah, and why? Which chemical is that? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing testosterone. <laughs> oh, <but> no. <laughs> and who wants to? Why? What is why? this for? Well, why? Uh, it's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, it can be when when made correctly, tangy and fizzy and delicious. Uh-huh. Really? Yeah. I had it once. My brother served it to me once. It was like I, you know, I, I didn't mind having it once. Mm-hmm. But okay. Twice was so, not happening. Yeah, right. there's um yeah there's some bad renditions out there, but they're also very good uh, uh-huh. renditions of it. So, no, he so paid wait, money for it. he paid real mm-hmm. money for his stash. So yeah. you're saying that it is for so first of all, I heard I, I saw a video I didn't hear I saw mm-hmm. a video on YouTube and the woman on the video was trying to show us how to make kombucha mm-hmm. and her first step was 
Well, you have to find somebody who has kombucha so that yeah. you can get their scoby. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's I was like, wait a minute. You don't get to do that. That's just like, I'm going to show you how to be a millionaire. The first thing you have to do is find somebody with a million dollars. Like, <laughs> come on now. Okay. So, so Ariel, who is kombucha number one? Who is that person? Who is, who yeah. is the earth is it kombucha? Some, is it some Tibetan monk? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I there's I a line of people. Probably <laughs> Northern China, although. <laughs> So I am not totally sure, but um, there, there are a couple, I mean, so there's some fermentations where like, it'll just happen if you, uh, if you like store it correctly and some like kombucha or um, kefir is another, is another one where yeah. some colony was established many, 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 many years ago and uh, worked so well that uh, people held onto it and, and passed it around. So we need a kombucha map where you can choose where you get your, where kombucha, you get your kombucha cocktail. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think Ben Wolf at Tufts, he's a microbiologist who's pretty cool, is doing a like kombucha mapping thing, so he might be able to. Uh, okay, cool. And so now, all, now the, from a scientific standpoint, you as a doctor, Ariel, are well, all I mean, of a, these... a doctor of agricultural and environmental chemistry, not a, not a medical doctor. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well. Okay. That is clear. That's. Don't uh, worry. Don't worry. If somebody has a heart attack in a restaurant, I will not call you. <laughs> I have. I have given the Heimlich maneuver in a restaurant. Before. Okay. Right okay. on. Yeah. So no. Are any of the claims to these these fantastical claims that uh, kombucha supposedly these benefits are any of them true, or is it more lore? Well, like. I'm, well, actually, I'm, we I'm, need to take a break right there. But when oh, we come okay. back, we will find out from. Ariel, if kombucha has any health benefits at all. Like, is that where you're going with that? Yeah. Chuck? Okay. <laughs> right when we come back, Star Talk Cosmic Queries. We're back, Star Talk Cosmic Queries. Chuck, nice. Hey, buddy. And I have Dr. Ariel Johnson, who's making her second appearance on Star Talk. We went into our Rolodex because she had first appeared live with us on stage. So thanks again for yeah, thank coming you. back. We're Cosmic Queries, pulling questions from our Patreon members. And we left off with a question about kombucha. And I've only been offered kombucha from health, from who, food health people, right? Uh, right? And they're making claims about it. And then I tasted it and I say, okay, I'm not, uh, the risk reward there is not <laughs> good enough for me. <laughs> Whatever is not <laughs> helping me in life, uh, the taste of that is worse, right? So um, can you, could you just comment on why people drink it and is it for flavor or are they, they're expecting some magic um, uh, healing to happen? Yeah, I mean, I mean, so personally, like I'm pretty skeptical of any like claims that, that any food uh, is, a, is a panacea, um, you know, as, as those are the kind of claims we get for a lot of foods now. Except, except kale, kale, kale. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Ariel. Sure. Kale, kale cures no. all. Chuck, Chuck, you know, I'm done with kale. I'm ready for the next vegetable to come along. I'm, I'm ready. Okay, so go on. Oh, so um, so to my knowledge, there's been a, a few but not extensive studies of uh, kombucha, particularly as a, uh, as a probiotic. Um, so, you know, our, our, our guts are full of bacteria. We have more bacterial cells in our body than human cells. Um, and uh, we, we use them to help us digest stuff and uh, and stay healthy. So uh, there, there's some idea that uh, you know bears out in data that kombucha can contribute live bacteria that is uh, helpful to your gut. Um, okay. I think I think some people do do drink it out of a sense of um, you know kind of a, an elixir uh, of of health. I'm not sure that's borne out by any peer-reviewed science um and, and a lot of people actually do drink it for taste um uh, especially as like you know an alternative to soda uh you, know, you got the fizz and the flavor but it's not quite as uh sweet and uh you know health destroying i'm just saying <laughs> if, there's, if there's a lemonade in front of me and kombucha i'm re reaching for the lemonade right that's on. fair no that's okay. totally fair i mean when um while well, i was working at noma um uh the restaurant in copenhagen we actually did a lot of uh it's like one of the most famous restaurants in the world very very yes, yeah. yes. okay uh -huh. um <laughs> i so i was working there as uh yeah i had we, we had a uh, fermentation lab um but we made a lot of kombuchas specifically for the menu for flavor um so we'd use things like elderflower or like heirloom apple and things like that and would uh you know transform them to become quite acidic and uh and tasty 
for things. Uh, yeah, so so it, is, it is definitely a, a, a flavor thing as well. So you're basically a food chemist. That's really what, what you Yeah, are. yeah. Right, so, right. I mean, my, my like, track uh, was food and wine chemistry, and my dissertation focused on flavor chemistry, and that's mostly what I do now. I mean, you know, sort of publicly. Wow. Yeah. Flavor chemistry. Yeah, yeah, it's my, well, uh, my that is. <laughs> That is the best use of science I've heard. <laughs> Thank you. In, in, a lo- in a long time, in a long time. Let me just tell you right now, that is that is stellar. Okay. Yeah. Well, All I, right. Give me another one, Chuck. Here we go. This is Matt uh, Matt Harefield, and Matt says, "I've heard about elephants and other mammals becoming intoxicated from consuming fermented fruit. How common is fermentation in the wild, mm-hmm. and what causes it?" Are mammals the only ones who partake? Hmm. Hmm. Well, Good question. So it's an excellent question. Um, yeah. So- by, the, by, by the way, let me just very quickly. Um, there's a very cool um, uh, alcoholic squirrel in my neighborhood. <laughs> and you cannot... You and we only see him at Halloween, and, and it may have it may be a family like father or son going down the line because year after year we had to stop leaving the pumpkins out because the squirrel, you know, you leave the pumpkin out for a while. A week later, mm-hmm. the pumpkin's still out there. Squirrel comes up, eats the pumpkin, and then you just see him kind of like wobbling around <laughs> the neighbor. He's just wobbling around the neighborhood like, "Yo, what's up? What's up?" <laughs> Hey, hey, what's up? Hey, what's up? <laughs> hey, can I? You got any Lucy's? Can I get a dollar for some cigarettes? Can I get a dollar for some cigarettes? So anyway, go ahead. Time, Chuck time lives in the off. zoo, the Philadelphia Zoo. <laughs> <laughs> well, so pr- pretty much any fermentation we do intentionally now started as like an accident or just sort of like the course of. Uh, of, of nature and you know the microbiome of wild microorganisms that are out living on things. So um, yeah, spontaneous spontaneous fer- fermentation of fruits happens like all the time. Um, you know we're able we're able to make wine because uh, the yeasts that create alcohol actually live on the skins of grapes. I mean now a lot of wine is made with inoculated yeast, but um, for you know most of the history of wine, which goes back <clears throat> at least eight thousand years, um, wow, was a was a uh, a wild fermentation with this yeast that was just. But is out there is the there grapes. enough? Okay, so the first fermentation is the yeast turning the grape sugars into alcohol. Mm-hmm. So if is there enough alcohol in a fermented fruit to make mammals go shit faced? Just oh by- yeah, just by I, yeah. I mean, you know, even uh, even a fruit that gets to like two or three percent alcohol, and many fruits can get much more alcoholic than that. Uh, if you're a, a small enough animal or you eat enough of it, uh, can can make you quite tipsy. Um, I've also heard the stories about elephants. I think there was a, um, there was like a TikTok video going around of a a pigeon that had eaten too many fermented apples and was just sort of like lying. Right. Face planted on the ground. Yeah, that was Chuck's yeah. backyard. All his animals. Were. <laughs> every every animal in my backyard is is absolutely plastered. Okay. I think I think you might be feeding them intentionally for the uh, comedic effect. <laughs> okay, so you don't have to be a mammal because birds aren't mammals. No. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I I am speculating here. This is getting getting sort of to the outer reaches of my specific knowledge, but um, I mean, you know, ethanol, ethyl alcohol, the product of alcoholic fermentation, you know, acts on central nervous systems, and uh, many animal central nervous systems have a lot of stuff in common. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, especially vertebrate animals, I guess. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. I mean, other molecules like nicotine um, from from tobacco work on you know various animals' nervous systems. Uh, including right. like insects, actually, um, but they don't, they don't have. Okay. Vertebra. But yeah, so cool. um, I would imagine most most mammals can get plastered from from fun fruit. Wow. Okay. Nice. All right. All right, Chuck. Give me another uh, one. Shoot, I'm ready to go get drunk with an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> elephant. Yeah. yeah. All, right. <laughs> All right. This is uh, this is uh, Luke. Uh, I wonder if the elephant start telling jokes. Uh, where does a 900 like- pound human sit? It's the 900 pound human in the middle of the room, guys. <laughs> I feel like they'd be very cuddly. Um, that might be, that might be fun. Yeah. I, let me tell you something. That's Frank the scariest Huck. thing I've heard is an elephant trying to cuddle you. I, 
Let me tell you, I, I, I just see shades of mice and men. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Luke uh, Jibicki. Luke Jibicki says this, or Gebicki, one or the other. He says, I have a jar of pickled sausages that says it never needs refrigeration. How does that work without spoiling? Is it safe to eat? And for how long? So... That's a great question because sometimes you think that those jars say that because they are vacuum packed mm. and that it doesn't need refrigeration for storage. But once you open it, perhaps you do. But what is the difference? Or I've, it, it, for me, I've never seen anything in vinegar that said must refrigerate. True. So vinegar must have yeah. some magic preserved have some, power. Yeah. yeah. Acetic acid is quite toxic to most microorganisms. That's the active um, acid in vinegar. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, so acetic acid itself is quite toxic, and the low pH um, also inhibits most most microbes. Uh, so it's like a, so it like really a it really is just a natural preservative. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, if it's a if it's a jar, I, I don't I can't tell. Well, just to be clear, but just to be clear, so high acid gives mm -hmm. you the low pH. So that's yes, high acid one and the gives same you thing. low pH. Yeah, that's one um, and the same. It's not high then, acid and low pH. No, that is the same no. thing. Good. Well, Good. actually, so technically, getting into some chemistry, the acetic acid molecule, only about like one in 10,000 of them actually is acidic. The rest stays like fully, uh, fully, fully together, non dissociated, and, and non acidic. So the ones that give up a hydrogen ion or a proton to create uh, a mm -hmm. low pH or acidity, um, that creates an inhospitable environment for spoilage microbes. But the whole undissociated, non-acidic, acetic acid molecule itself uh, is is also toxic. I think it interrupts the cell membrane of um, Oh, interesting. Of but that wouldn't then trigger the, 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 the litmus score for it, even the, if it is preservative. I see. I see. So, okay. So the acidity <laughs> is not a direct measure of how much acetic acid is in it. Right. Have, you need activated molecules. Yeah. Well, I mean, the there's, there's like every every acid has its natural balance that it will that it will go okay. to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. So uh, um, when he says, "How does that work?" We just you mm -hmm. just said that. Is it yeah. how long is it safe to eat something that is stored that way? Um. Well, I mean, so when you're when you're talking about, especially like. Uh, preserved meats and things, you're getting into a concept called water activity. Uh, so like the more the more acid, the more salt, uh, or the more sugar you have, the lower the available water is. So I mean, that's why uh, jam, which is just like, you know, spoilable fruits that you've added a lot of sugar to can sit uh, in your cupboard for, you know, a year, uh, because there's just not enough free water for microbes to to do their thing. Interesting. Um, I mean, with wild. stuff like that, there's probably a best point. Oh, so that's why that's why dried it. dried like beef jerky. Jerky. Yes, exactly, exactly. It's, beef it's jerky. Got, it's lost all liquid or dried salmon yeah, or any of this. Yeah, uh, lots of charcuterie and salumi. Um, you know, things like pepperoni or uh, capicola, uh, either whole mussels. Sorry, right, sorry, uh, Ariel. I'm uh -huh. sorry. I'm from Philadelphia. It's not Capricorn. Sorry, sorry. It, Gabagool. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> just wanted sorry, to be in intelligible to as many people okay. as possible. Yeah. So I, also, I also ascribe to the school of Gabagool. Um, yeah, we, need, we, need, we need Chuck's hood to still understand this conversation. Okay. <laughs> all, his peep, all his peeps back in the hood. Yeah, they sorry, would never sorry. let me. They would ne nobody would ever let me live down Capicola. Well, I can't, okay? I can't yeah. let that happen. Well, yeah. Let me invert the question. What mm -hmm. do you know is not turned off by the high acid Ooh. vinegar solution Ooh, that good. would still Ooh. grow regardless? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Just to invert the question. You know, there's there's plenty of like extremophile microbes out there. Um, so, you that know, love so high like, acid. Uh, yeah, high acid or high salt. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for for the most part, if you're adding a lot of salts to stuff, that excludes most most microbes. But then, like soy sauce, which usually ferment at like twelve to twenty percent salt, which is like super high. Um, there's an extremophile yeast called Zygosaccharomyces ruxii that like loves that level of salt and actually contributes to the flavor. Um, That's a badass name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it really is. Well, let me let me hear that again. Oh, uh, say it again. Zygosaccharomyces ruxii. 
Man. Nice. Ooh. You know what? You just sound like you casted a spell on something. <laughs> it does. Spell, that was a very Harry Potter soy spell. Sauce flavor. <laughs> <laughs> that was totally, that was a witch, that was a witch spell right there. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so now when you say that, um, that, that bacteria uh, loves it and mm-hmm. adds to the flavor. So mm-hmm. will it ultimately spoil the soy sauce or does it just enhance the soy sauce? That, that one's generally not a spoilage microbe. Um, okay. I mean, I suppose like it just produces like alcohol and flavor molecules. Gotcha. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of any really significant like high acid, high salt tolerant spoilage microbes. Um, a real microbiologist might be mad at me right now for uh, for not identifying one, but um, mostly you don't have like a ton to worry about. And like what you should be looking out for, for like unrefrigerated things possibly going bad would be like off smells that shouldn't be there or like visible mold. Um, visible mm-hmm. mold, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's That should always be a sign. <laughs> 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 I'm, yeah, I don't have a degree in anything <laughs> chemistry, but I'm pretty sure that's a good sign. You don't yeah. need it. Well, I mean, you know, up until up until Pasteur, that's how everyone knew that, uh, that something right. was going bad. Yeah. yeah, it's just like, hmm, this bread is hairy. Yeah. All right, <laughs> I'm going to pass. All right, cool. Smart. All right, give me another one before we can go to break. Mm. Okay, all right. Hi, Ariel. Hi, Neil. Often we hear of uh, the words fermentation. Wait, they didn't say hi to you, Chuck? They did not. I- Oh, that's cold. Yeah, that's that cold. is that is cold. That okay, is cold. and who is it? Who's the person? Um, you know what? Here's the thing. They don't even. Oh nope. Here it is. Their 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 name was on the previous page. It's uh, Avinov Abraham. So okay, okay. Avinov right. Abraham, who mm-hmm. clearly doesn't like me. So, <laughs> but you know what? You know what? I I read everybody's question. It doesn't make a difference how you feel about that me. That is so sweet of you. <laughs> right. I'm right, the, what's the question? I'm the Joe Biden of Cosmic Queries. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Hi, Ariel. Hi, Neil. Often we hear of the words fermentation with regards to preserving food and making alcohol with the help of microorganisms. But what precautions are needed to take with respect to the fermentation process so that the next time I'm making my homemade wine, I don't end up creating some super bug that <laughs> that, that will uh, uh, further harm this current scenario. Or, or, or ferment the world. <laughs> Actually, uh, we, went, we just ran out of time, but we'll come back in the third segment. We'll lead off with the answer to that question on Star Talk, Cosmic Queries, the fermentation edition. We're back. Cosmic queries, food and fermentation. What does it all mean? Why do we do it? Uh, and we just blame Ariel for everything that's happening. Yay! <laughs> Ariel, uh, again, welcome back to our Star Talk family for this show. Chuck, always good to have you here. Always a pleasure. And, and so, Ariel, we, we we left off with someone asking about yeasts gone wild. Mm-hmm. I guess you know how to. You know, you can use it for some purpose, some contained purpose, but could they mutate? Could they become an infectious bug? There's all this fermenting going on where we think we're in control of the microbes, but maybe one day the microbes will Mm. fight back. Rise up! (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, for this is well outside the scope of the time that we have for anyone that's interested in getting into that much more like philosophically. uh, Heather Heather Paxson is a... uh, science and technology studies scholar at MIT and has really interesting work on what she calls microbiopolitics um, that, that talks a lot about Whoa, this stuff. Whoa, that's a thing, uh, that's a phrase? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, but getting getting back to the subject of the question. Well, so microorganisms are constantly mutating and evolving. Um, I mean, you know, random mutation is what drives evolution uh, and, and microbes are constantly uh, you know, mutating and swapping genes and trying new stuff out to like better adapt to their environments. Um, mm-hmm. So that's just going to happen anyway. As uh, as we are as we are currently all living. Yes. <laughs> as a reality. <laughs> we are, we are right uh, now <laughs> determining our fitness for this particular environmental stress. And I just have to clarify something because mm-hmm. it, it's it's a common uh, misconception. It's not that the bacteria are trying to survive. 
by experimenting. Mm. It's that mm. they are always experimenting. Mm -hmm. right. And if you have a change in the environment, it kills everything that can't survive yes. it. Yes. And so it's not like, oh, the environment changed, let me adapt. No, nothing no. adapts. There's always built right. in some variation and you live or die and the species adapts, but the organism does not. I yes. guess that's the yeah. point I want to make. Draw Definitely. Home there. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah. good. No, that's okay. a good, yeah. Uh, random mutation is always happening. It's often bad for organisms. Yes, but occasionally exactly. it's randomly good. Mm -hmm. um, although some, some microbes do engage in horizontal gene transfer. Um, I don't think there's any. That sounds painful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any like choosing of what's good there, but it's another Chuck, give me some of your genes. To... Yeah. I'm, I'm only into vertical gene transfer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just letting you know that. <laughs> it's, good. it's good to know your, uh, your boundaries. Um, so, so what could happen? So, uh, yeah, I mean, so yes, yeasts, yeast will mutate. Um, but, uh, I, I think probably in the course of a fermentation that you're doing at home or in a, in a winery, uh, probably nothing's going to mutate to become like totally crazy and outside the bounds of anything you've seen. Right. And escape the winery. And then, yeah, yeah. then we have maps of the zones, yeah. you know, it would be like, like you know, World War Z, except for microbes. Yeah. Um, I mean, if that were to happen in your homemade wine, it would happen on a piece of fruit out in the wild just as just as easily. So uh, if that's, that's a scenario that will happen, we're screwed anyway. Um, but uh, I mean- Okay, so Chuck, you get her, her answer is don't panic. <laughs> not, everything is fine. There's nothing wrong. <laughs> not okay, <right>. that's- Exactly. <laughs> Very cool. Um, I mean, actually with, uh, with, with, in terms of like precautions for homemade wine, like- What's more likely to happen is that the like balance that, of microbes is, will will shift. Oh, and, and your wine will taste like crap. That's what's yeah. really. <laughs> that's yes, the more that's likely. the. So I mean, even even if you add like one strain of yeast to to something or one strain of bacteria, the the fermentation is going to involve many different species kind of forming and whole ecological system uh, in what you're doing. So with uh, with wine, probably what's more likely to happen is that a a wild yeast. Um, like Britannomyces or a uh, a bacteria will uh, you know stay on for the ride and possibly make some off flavors you don't want, or uh, if the wine is too exposed to oxygen, that you're going to get uh, acetic acid turning it into vinegar. Right. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. Gen okay. I mean, generally, alcoholic fermentations aren't super high risk. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so we're safe continuing to make wine in your basement. I think right? so. Yeah. yeah. Without I mean, like, so, if, it, so, if it gets so, moldy, throw it out. <laughs> yeah. So, but now speaking of that, so what is mold wine then? Is it actually mold wine? Yeah. Is it actual mold? I've heard of oh, this mold, mold, mold wine. Mold wine. M U L L E D. Right. As opposed okay. to M O L D. Well, I mean, mold wine. Okay. Is Chuck just got the wrong word, so you don't have to answer him. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> no, although, Chuck, although no Chuck, got, Chuck just got homonym. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> although, although rice wines all start with a uh, cultured mold, uh, okay. usually an Aspergillus species that has been mostly domesticated. Right on. Uh, yeah. So, what is mold wine, though? With a U or with an O? No, with the U. With I mean, the, the, oh, the, it's, uh, the real <laughs> wine, the real wine that they call real, mold the wine. Mold wine. I, yeah. Um, it's it's wine that you uh, heat up and add spices and sometimes fruit to. So I guess. Okay, the, the so that's what makes it. Okay, yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah. So no. it's uh, uh, you know, the heat probably, and even the you know spices have antimicrobial anti compounds, so that would probably make it even less susceptible to mold with an O than. Okay. Wine. And just while we're on the subject of homemade uh, microbes, uh, tell me about sourdough bread. Yeah, well, so sourdough, before the advent of commercial yeasts, um, most most breads had something like a sourdough starter. Uh, sourdough is just a mixture of, of yeasts, lactic acid bacteria, and acetic bacteria, all of which can kind of live in, in wet grains. Um, and by, you know, feeding them some flour and some some water and letting them do their thing, they, uh, they add some nice flavors to a dough that you make. Uh, but more importantly, they create carbon dioxide as one of their waste products. Um, so by uh, kind of tending, tending this uh, farm of, of mixed microbes, you can cause uh, cause your bread to rise in the oven, um, as you would with a commercial yeast, but with more with more flavors. Okay. Mm, okay. okay. So a little more flavorful and complex, I guess. That's it. Yeah. All right. So yeah, but, wait, some people will say, though, here's a sourdough from a recipe from my great great grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, who cares? Why does that matter? <laughs> 
Well, so um, I mean, like, two, <laughs> one yeah. aspect of it is that um, why is that a boast? Is that why, when why is it the like how you feed? So you start with a starter that you're constantly feeding. Um, so kind of keeping it like an animal uh, in in the zoo. So you're constantly, you know, every every day or every several days, adding adding flour and water to it. Gotcha. Um, so so when you when you choose to do that, um, how much it has fermented from the previous batch before you add more? How much you throw out or like? Uh, incorporate and then how much does this water purify you have. the strain? Is, um, when you do this over generations and generations, I mean it's it's always it's like pretty dynamic. So once uh, when you first add flour and water to a starter, there's more like I think more yeast activity going on, and then as it gets older and more mature, it'll get more and more acidic. Um, mm -hmm. So so then when you when you feed it, and then when the like number of hours that you let pass before between feeding and actually making it into bread can have like a huge effect on flavor and rise. Okay. So, so no, the I protocol see. that you follow that your grandmother figured out um, can actually be a pretty big deal. So this right. is a new title of a movie, the sourdough protocol. <laughs> that's, that's a, a, nice. <laughs> a, okay. a new mission impossible. Yeah. Right. The sourdough with, uh, protocol. With French bakers. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right, All right Chuck, give me go. another one. Here's uh, Joy Pinheiro Denise, who says this. Uh, I love you guys, Dr. Tyson, Dr. Johnson. Oh, oh and Dr. Nice. Okay, see, uh, she's made up for... She made up for... For the uh, other one, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so take that, Anivav. <laughs> 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 she goes, um, my question is, given the state of the world when it comes to land shortage for growing crops, is there a way to genetically produce an easily grown hardy crop with high yield that contains the perfect amount of vitamins and minerals, amino acids and Proteins, basically a living version of what they eat in on the Nebuchadnezzar hover ship in the <laughs> Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> yes, by the way, she says, I know that's Neil's favorite movie. Thank you. <laughs> she, did, she knew that. So Classic. that's the scene where they, it comes out of the spigot and it right. looks kind of like, as they say in the movie, it looks like a pile of snot right. and they're eating it. They say, no, oh, it's got all the amino acids and vitamins that a healthy body needs. Right. So I'm curious and about that. It tastes that. like tasty wheat, right? <laughs> tastes like, yes! <laughs> I've been so, watching a lot of movies in uh, in quarantine, or rewatching. So Ariel, uh, uh, well, one other point here in the movie Deep Impact, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, I don't won't get into the details, but there's a scene where there's someone offloading, they're getting ready for the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Someone offloading these groceries and they're full of uh, little cans of Ensure. Mm. And so if I understand it, the cans of Ensure, which are typically eaten by older people, right. are have all the protein and vitamins and minerals and carbohydrates you need. And and they come in a can, so they don't have to mm. be refrigerated. So if the world is going to end, you want to fill your groceries, you know, don't leave the toilet paper alone. Otherwise, right. you can wipe yourself. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so my, a good question is, is there some garden mixture of of foods uh let's assume you can't raise a cow so mm -hmm. garden mixture of vegetables where at a minimum size one person can live off of that oh was that the so two questions one um, one, one about, is the one, one is the crop one is the crop, crop and yeah. the other engineering is the crops and the minimum and, the minimum amount of garden space um I am not really sure what the minimum amount of garden space to translate into edible calories and nutrients is. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, uh, uh, for example, like one one chestnut tree might be able to, uh, at, at maturity, provide enough carbohydrates to keep one person uh, fed for a year. Um, I mean, I setting aside the apocalyptic scenarios where you would actually just have to have a uh, you know single cell protein tasty wheat um mm -hmm. generally the most like nutritious and resilient systems that you should be trying to doing uh to plan for the apocalypse would be like fairly biodiverse ones so like growing as many plants together as possible um you know humans humans are pretty uh interesting in their ability to like get nutrition from lots of different things. Uh, you know, we're omnivores, but we're like omnivores that can make our diets out of nearly anything. So we, uh, we interviewed the creator and founder of Soylent, mm -hmm. this liquid. And this is this one, you know, it's your entire meal in a, in a, in a cup. Yeah. And it's you can, people. <laughs> you can live off of that. It's I was counting down the seconds to see how long it would take you. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, it, I this, no, this is Soylent Blue, not Soylent uh-huh. Green. Okay. Just okay. to make that clear. Right. No. So, but it's the worst part of people. <laughs> <laughs> so, what intrigued me was he can make the exact ingredients that you need, but he mm. wanted it to be more more friendly to the ecosystem and wanted mm-hmm. to uh, infuse it with sort of base amino acids from the as low on the food chain as he could go. Mm. And I was very intrigued by that as, a, as a, at least as, as a, as a, as a goal. Yeah. Well, I know, I know a, there's a lot of people interested in algae, uh, as, yeah, that, for example, yeah, exactly. As sources of both proteins and, and fats. Um, cause, uh, yeah, fats are actually pretty important dietarily, mm-hmm, uh, especially mm-hmm. if you're eating a lot of protein. Um, right, right. Yeah, so there's, there's definitely a lot of research happening on that. Okay, um, all right. So we may we, we may be seeing a future where we, uh, uh, you know, have gigantic tanks of algae that we uh, that then harvest and and eat. Now, now, right. now that's nasty. Yeah. <laughs> Tanks of algae. Yeah. Please, sir, well, I mean, that's grab the, some more. Yeah. <laughs> that would be the most brutal version of oh, a uh, future yeah. scenario. That, just kill me, okay? There's a, <laughs> that's, I, I'm going on record. Just kill me. I don't, that's a thin gruel I never want to have to eat. Yeah, the word, the word vat and the word algae together in the mm. same sentence. I yeah, not, so not nasty. Good. All right. Chuck, we got time maybe for one more question. Go. All right, let's get to a chemistry question from Douglas Stern, who says, has NASA used chemistry to ferment foods that astronauts eat in order to help them maintain better health while visiting the International Space Station, or would consuming artificial supplements just be an easier route? Live long and prosper. Oh, nice. Mm. Nice. So what do you know about the IS? I I can tell you what I know about it. Oh, yeah. I know a little bit, but you probably know more. Yeah, there are enough supply ships to the ISS, they just wait for the burger to come up. <laughs> well, no, so, no, no. By the way, they're, get, they're getting cosmic Uber Eats. Yeah. The Uber Eats. <laughs> they're getting cosmic Uber Eats at the ISS, buddy. Okay. No, no. <laughs> Space um, Grubhub, that's yeah. what we're talking about. It's, it's the long-term voyages where they're really thinking about this, where yeah, you don't have a yeah. supply chain to it. You know, nine months to Mars, two months on location, coming back, you're away for three years. Right. So, I, yeah, I, I'm, so I don't know if they're leaning towards just preserved food or, you know, salt preserved, you know, desiccated food or, or um, the, pr- the problem is liquid weighs a lot. Yes. Relative to other things. And so if you need a big vat of your pickles that were then it's liquid holding them, mm-hmm. I don't know that that would be a first choice. Right. No, I mean, uh... I, I was I, so on the subject. I actually was. Uh, I guess in 2017, I went to a workshop at uh, Johnson Space Center specifically on like in o- Houston, open sourcing. Right. Uh, wait, no, Kennedy in the one in Florida. Kennedy. Oh, Kennedy. That'd Kennedy, be Kennedy Space Johnson. Center. Yeah, yes. Kennedy. Okay. My bad. Mm-hmm. Um, about like sort of what open source could do uh, to to think about food in food in space. Um, so I know that you know they're they're doing plant growth experiments at at NASA and they will actually like bring up seeds and water and grow, uh, you know, f- four tomatoes and one strawberry. And that will be your, uh, I mean, obviously not a big nutritional component of an astronaut. It's a start. Diet, but it's, it's, important. <laughs> it's, a start. It's, it's good for uh, morale. Which mm, that's a start. Um, it's a yeah, start. Yeah, really. and, and it's much better than a poop potato. So. <laughs> 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 Although I don't know, after after like you know however many weeks, I think those poop potatoes would start looking pretty good. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. As, yeah. So as that's, Pinocchio says in the original book, uh, "Hunger makes the best sauce." Indeed. Wow! <laughs> wow! I love that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, so in terms of like fermentation, um, I don't think uh, I don't think NASA is doing much. With, with fermentation, if only because they try to not send as many, uh, any, any microbes up into space. They try to sterilize things uh, to avoid right, right, right. contamination. Um, okay, that's very, very, uh, very important and excellent point, I, I would think. But, but uh, we got to wrap this up. Let mm-hmm. me end with a, with a question. Is there, are there fermentative, um, is there a frontier of fermentation where you'll show up one day? Here's a newly fermented thing that didn't previously exist in the food catalogs. <laughs> Here, mm-hmm. is, is it your, you and your people do those kinds of experiments, inventing foods? Yeah, well, I've I've actually um, done some work. But, I have uh, I have friends at a company called Ginkgo BioWorks. Uh, they are a like synthetic biology 
startup, they may have surpassed startup phase. They're doing quite well. Um, but uh, so what they do is engineer microbes uh, to do interesting things. Um, and uh, they, they had some cool strains of, uh, of yeasts, uh, some yeasts that were producing uh, carotenoids, um, which are orange pigments in, uh, in, in flowers and grass and, and carrots that are actually the precursors to a lot of interesting like fruity flavors. Um, and then also yeasts that were producing flavor molecules specifically. Uh, so I- Okay, so Chuck, what she's saying there is that nature is insufficient for our <laughs> <laughs> There's some flavors we need. There's some um, food. We, we're just doing do it ourselves. Yeah. Right? So, um, so there, I, I and their creative director, uh, Christina Agapakis, who's pretty awesome, um, got together and we're making some fermented foods with these totally brand new, uh, you know, su super flavor molecule producing strains. Okay. So if you are, don't exist the next time we invite you, it's because it's one of those experiments. <laughs> yeah. wrong, right. Okay. We'll have created the, uh, the super bug that took It's like, out. try this. Yeah. Okay, sure. <laughs> All right. We got, we got to end it there, okay. unfortunately, but uh, Ariel Johnson, very delighted to have you back. On. Oh, delighted to be here. Uh, thanks for all and the great questions. We'll surely find another excuse to bring you back. I certainly uh, hope so. <laughs> Chuck, I'm glad we now uh, can pronounce words co correctly as they do in Philadelphia. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I still can't pronounce names correctly, but at least we know that Capicola is Gabagool. Gabagool, Gabagool. for life. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this has been Cosmic Queries, the fermentation edition. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, always with you to keep looking up. <laughs>